The world has been shown in the last couple days and weeks just why we need cryptocurrency. Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, what I want to do is a really quick what is Bitcoin, why it, uh, it has value. It's going to be really difficult to do because I can tend to get long winded and it's honestly it's so complicated. Um, but a little explain it like I'm five type uh, explanation here on Bitcoin. So I'm going to try my best. Okay, first step, we've got to talk about what is money. Um, Let's go back to the most kind of crude version of money, which would be like, say, a goat or a chicken. Um, so you can exchange value with someone by maybe you give them your chicken, they give you um, a goat, maybe you settle on three chickens are worth a goat, that kind of thing. Now, these values exchanges are really poor um, ways to handle currency and money. And the reason why is that basically your money now is tied directly to the thing that gives the value. And while that might make sense that it's actually a good thing, it's actually a really bad thing, especially when you can lose those things, when those things can actually get damaged or when they can actually die or rot, like, you know, in the case of food or bread. Now, as time goes by, we started getting more abstract with what money was, what exchange of value was. And maybe we would collect seashells and seashells were the value and the commodity that was exchanged. And the important thing here is that what's required in order for that to be accepted by people is that people need to have faith in the fact that they're receiving something that they can then give at a future date for the thing that has value. So um, you're not going to accept a seashell for your goat. Um, if you don't think that someone else down the road will take your seashell back for three chickens. This is really important. And this is why throughout the history of what we use for money, it's been fought every step of the way. So when we move from goats to seashells to say, now all of a sudden we're going to mint some metals, turn them into coins and give them to people. I don't know if I want those coins for my goat because I can actually eat my goat. Um, I think I'm just going to keep my goat. I don't know if anyone's going to give me a chicken or three chickens for those metal, you know, pieces that you have. And time goes by and then people get more comfortable with the fact that there's an expectation of return on getting something back for your coins. Then we go from coins to pieces of paper and we say, trust us, this piece of paper is just as good as that coin. If I exchange these two things for me, for you, and I give you one of these pieces of paper and you give me two of those coins, someone else down the road will give you two of these coins for your piece of paper. People rejected that. I think I'll just keep my yellow coin here instead. And time goes by and all of a sudden people now are believing that there's value in that paper. Now we're not going to actually even give you that paper anymore. You're going to do a day's work for me and see this little database here. See this number. This represents how many of those papers you have in your account with me. And instead of giving you the paper, I'm just going to pop that number up a thousand of them. And that represents however many days you're willing to trade that labor for. But this number changing on this device, on this server that I control, um, Trust me, someone down the road will give you three chickens for one of those little digits that's in my database. So often people, when they talk about Bitcoin, they get stuck in this whole thing of how, you know, everyone, it has no value. It's not backed by anything. And the fact of the matter is, is that the world we live in is already there. The world we live in is already digital. Um, Money is created not by actually printing money, but by just by adjusting the numbers in someone's database, giving um, John minus $200,000 of these data digits and then crediting the construction company who made his house $200,000 of those data digits. This is the way that the world is right now. And in doing so, the bank basically printed $200,000 
took it from John, gave it to the um, builder, and now they have a debt from John owing to the bank that is funneling new digits into the bank. And in this way, when that debt is paid, then, you know, at first when it was a zero sum game, eventually, um, there was a wash, no new money was created. But as that debt gets paid and, you know, John trades his time and labor for more of those data digits and that data digits get sent to the bank, um, the bank has created an income stream literally out of thin air. This is our basically our, what our monetary system is right now. Um, it works. Uh, it works largely because people have faith in it that it does work. Um, but as soon as we moved off the gold standard for what the US dollar was, those data digits and that dollar, um, it's actually not backed by anything other than people's expectation that they'll get future returns on that currency. And this is basically what gives anything value. Something has value if people think it has value. And um, that's not new with Bitcoin. People use that as an argument to take away from what Bitcoin is. The fact of the matter is that's just the way the world works. And that's where we are right now. Okay, so now let's get to what Bitcoin is and then we'll get to other cryptocurrencies. Okay, so what actually is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is um, basically a piece of software that runs on a computer and what it does is it sends information out to other computers on the internet and when it finds another computer that's also running that software they start comparing the data that they're being sent and received and when you get this software running on enough computers then now you have this network effect where all these computers are peer checking against each other and verifying and validating transactions so now, instead of me just showing you, I have this number on this computer, I'm a bank, bank. I have this number on this computer in my database that I control and I can change whenever I want. Um, trust me, someone will give you money for that down the road. And you having to trust me, the bank, who's got your best interests in mind. Um, instead of that, now all of a sudden, what we do is we take that server and we put it and spread it across the world. Now, if me, Mr. Bank, doesn't like what you, Mr. Innocent Bystander, is doing with your money, I can't lock your money, I can't block your money. I can't, when you wanna take it to another country, say, ah, give me some cash for that. I can't limit how much you take. I can't do anything because I have no power. Because my server that's doing all this, that I'm taking fees off of you for simply having an account or simply having money with me, um, that I'm making off, making money off you by investing um, and charging you a fee. I can't do any of that stuff anymore. Now, this server is running, this Bitcoin program is running on computers all across the world. And the more computers that run this software that's validating these transactions, the more robust and stable this whole thing becomes. If it's just 10, 10 people running the software, if I hack six of them, I can literally take control of the whole server and move the money wherever I want. Because it's cryptographically um, contained, I have to spend computing power to break that code. So six people, I could probably handle it. When it gets to the fact that this is on millions of computers across the world, all of a sudden the energy required for me to perform that attack literally does not exist on the face of the planet. I cannot hack this program anymore. And that's what gives Bitcoin its value. So Bitcoin is nothing other than basically a ledger, just a list of numbers. And it's a wallet address and how much Bitcoin is associated with that wallet. Now there's two types of wallets. There's a private and a public wallet. So the public wallet is the one that's on the ledger. Anyone can see it at any time that is linked to the private wallet that's cryptographically um, locked up and sealed. And it's actually so locked up and sealed that again, in order to hack that and get that information, it would take more energy than exists on the planet. So um, in this way, you can have, you know, public blockchain wallet say, I want to give half a Bitcoin to this public blockchain wallet. And then what happens is that request goes out to all the other computers running the software. 
they validate, does this guy even have a half a Bitcoin? Is this a legitimate legal wallet? All that kind of stuff. And when they all come to a consensus that this is a legal like, transaction and it's just code that executes to validate all of that, then they basically um, confirm that the transaction is appropriate and it's transferred over. That record is in the ledger forever. Okay, so the value in having the Bitcoin is that there's a future promise that someone will give me a car if I give them a Bitcoin. And I think over the last 10 years or so, we have you know demonstrable proof that that is the case. And again, this is no different than the world as it exists today. In fact, Bitcoin is more secure and has more value than even the fiat currency that we think has value. That depends on literally nothing else than our make-believe fantasy um, fairy tale that it actually has value. One last thing about Bitcoin, the reason why it has so much value. When those computers are validating those transactions, the computers that successfully do that will get what's called a mining reward. And they'll get a small portion of that as a fee. Now the fee is very small, but it does ramp up with the amount of users on board. And when Bitcoin catches on, the fees scale up and the time to complete the, the computations actually get more complex too. So the time to do it actually increases. And that's why transaction times increase the more network traffic there are. There's second layer protocols that are trying to get around that. I don't want to bore everyone on that. Um, but the financial incentive to validate the transactions is that they get a little chunk of it. That's called proof of work. And that's where the energy thing comes in. Because more and more people are using Bitcoin, the computational requirements to do that verification are getting more and more complex. The computational power to run those computers um, is creating more and more energy. And this is why Bitcoin, while extremely valuable, has moved from a currency to a store of value because um, it's using so much energy to perform those transactions um, that it's not really a great tool for humans to use to do that. Now, at the same time, there's a really, really solid argument to be made that the energy being used to mine Bitcoin has been demonstrated over and over again to be largely solar energy, free energy, you know, except for the wasted solar panels. And that's another topic. Um, but it's largely green energy that's running the Bitcoin network. Now, even with that said, the amount of energy that Bitcoin is using is actually less than the system that is disrupting. So even though it is a lot of energy, um, it's actually better for hum humankind to move towards it and get off of the fiat currency. And that is not even talking about the power thing. I don't mean electrical power, I mean the rich and powerful. Okay, power is really important because the number people are doing the Bitcoin thing to get rich. Like, let's not beat around the bush. The reason why people buy Bitcoin is the expectation to sell it for a higher price down the road. But the value of Bitcoin for humanity is the fact that it takes power away from the people who are controlling the world right now. And the real strength of Bitcoin is that they cannot stop it. If they could have, this is the largest threat to the power inequality that has ever existed on the planet. If it could be shut down, it would have been shut down in its infancy. It cannot be shut down. Now, there's other aspects like a lot of the Bitcoins are already owned by people. Um, but the thing is, is there's so much trading going on right now that as time goes by, the wallets get even more decentralized and the world going towards using Bitcoin, I think my personal opinion, this whole piece is personal opinion, um, but I think it's a better thing for humanity than the power of corruption that currently exists with government run currencies. A big thing about that is that most government run currencies are just monitored by the government. For example, the Federal Reserve sounds really governmentally. Um, it's not, it's run by a private organization and it is, um, monitored by the government. But we've seen that it takes them a long time to decide to give, you know, I'm talking about the United States, to give people a small little $600 or $1,200 or $2,000 coronavirus aid check. It takes them a lot of time to do that. But 
giving out $2 trillion of stimulus to help their buddies stay solvent, that happens immediately. And it's because they're the ones who are now impacted by that. It's also because the economy would literally collapse if some of these organizations went down. Um, but nonetheless, when they need to save themselves, they do it very quickly. Now, with something like Bitcoin, um, there's only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever exist in the history of Bitcoin. Many of them have already been lost. Um, who knows how much is out there right now available for purchase? Not that much. But the thing is, is if everyone in the world wanted to own a single Bitcoin, only 21 million people could. That's not a whole lot. Um, right now, you can buy a Bitcoin for somewhere around $30,000. Ballpark, it's all over the place right now. Might go up, might be worth $2,000 in a, you know, six months from now. But the most important thing is that it, you can't kill it. It's always going to be there. Thank you.